everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we have esteemed Dr. Janet Pope as our guest speaker. Uh, many of you might have heard her from about three years ago, so thank you for coming back, Dr. Pope. Uh, Dr. Janet Pope is a professor at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. She's a medical expert and specializing in rheumatology and epidemiology. She also leads the rheumatology division at St. Joseph Health Centre in London, Ontario. She earned her medical degree and completed her training in internal medicine at the University of Western Ontario, followed by specialized training in rheumatology and public health at Boston University. She's an active member of various research groups and committees focusing on conditions like scleroderma, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Dr. Janet Pope. Great, thank you so much, Sharon, for a lovely introduction. And I'm actually quite honored to be asked to be here. And I'm hoping that um, we'll have lots of questions and interaction. And um, I'm hoping to give this at a level that it helps everyone from people learning on their journey about interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, up to and including people that have uh, lived with this or had a loved one live with this for a long time. So I really want to be um, giving you the state of the art, but giving it in, in terms that make sense when you're a person trying to uh, figure out the healthcare system and the pathway to uh, diagnosis and treatment and monitoring treatment and what specialists you would see and things like that. So it's really what you need to know about interstitial lung disease and or pulmonary fibrosis and the connective tissue diseases such as lupus, um, scleroderma, myositis, Sjogren's, et cetera, and rheumatoid arthritis. And these are the diseases that rheumatologists see. And so we have a lot of overlap when you might be seeing your respirologist, your pulmonologist as well. Um, and these are my disclosures. So I consult for a lot of people and I'm on lots of committees. So at the end of this session, I'm hoping you'll be able to know more about connective tissue diseases and rheumatoid arthritis and um, their risk and what might happen with interstitial lung disease and understand some of the investigations and treatments um, for interstitial lung disease and, and types of patients, rheumatology patients that I would see. So first of all, there is some new terminology, and we'll talk about definitions shortly. So there's this new terminology called progressive pulmonary fibrosis. But if we just back up a second, there's interstitial lung disease that could be inflammation of the lungs and other, there's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and other pulmonary fibrosis, which would be more scarring of the lungs. And they can be together, they can be separate. Um, and the ones that I'm talking about, so you can see the different groups, there's sarcoidosis, there's um, uh, ones that are, I'm going from the opposite way forward this way. So uh, ones that are cystic or airspace filling, they're not very common. There's exposure related, um, such as uh, things you can inhale, like asbestos, silica, uh, coal miners get silicosis, things like that. There's the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. So the ones I'm talking about is the second group in these autoimmune um, interstitial lung disease. So rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis, mixed connective tissue disease, inflammatory myositis, Sjogren's, vasculitis, lupus, and others. So there's a whole bunch of diagnoses that I make. The blue stuff is telling you um, the proportion that would have the progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So you can see it's not everybody in uh, this, but it's a bit more common to be progressive pulmonary fibrosis if you have scleroderma or rheumatoid than some of the other ones. And that's where we have a lot of the data when it comes to treatment. So what I'm going to talk about especially is rheumatoid arthritis but and scleroderma, but also these dermatomyositis, that's inflammation with skin involvement or not, muscle inflammation that can have interstitial lung disease, 
lupus, which is systemic lupus erythematosus, or we call it SLE or lupus. Sjogren's syndrome, that's an autoimmune condition with dry eyes, dry mouth, and they can get interstitial lung disease, which is often a little bit different than the rest. And mixed connective tissue diseases, some stuff of various um, uh, other connective tissue diseases. So they kind of have more than one problem going on of their autoimmune connective tissue disease. There's also... Um, probably in the question someone might ask, but I'm not going to talk about it too much. There's also a group where we can't define what they have, but they have some features of connective tissue disease, but don't make a full diagnosis, but they're mostly lung involvement. So they have inflammation or and or scarring of their lungs and maybe a positive autoantibody and maybe Raynaud's or maybe a rash, but don't they don't have full-blown dermatomyositis as a for instance. So they're in this group in a way too, and they're the IPAF they're called, and they don't, the, the definition of that changes over time, but they, they would be treated like what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So the prevalence is very, and I don't want you to remember to take home, oh, how common is this or that? Because people either get it or they don't with these various conditions, but in scleroderma, it's about a third of our patients and half of them, it's clinically relevant that it will progress. And rheumatoid, it's only about 10% of men and seven or 8% of women that will get progressive uh, lung change. Myositis, it's about a third of them. Lupus, it's very uncommon, less than 10%, less than one in 10. Uh, Sjogren's, one in 10 to even what, as high as one in three. I don't see it as high as one in three. So I've written the percents in the rheumatology literature off to the side and mixed connective tissue disease because they can have features of those other things. It could be one in 10, could be a bit more, could be a bit less. So pulmonary fibrosis, if you looked it up on Wikipedia or something, it'd be thickening of the lung tissues. And this thickening would be irreversible scarring. And if you have a sponge and we drop out areas in the sponge and just make them all scar, then you can't get gas through, through gas exchange, getting rid of carbon monoxide, or sorry, carbon dioxide, but getting oxygen in becomes less and less and the lungs become firm so it's hard to breathe when you're breathing against the wall so that's what progressive pulmonary fibrosis is all about but there's various types of pulmonary fibrosis so the ones that some of you have heard more about are ipf or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis but a lot of my patients that have this condition with their connective tissue disease, they have more commonly the non-specific interstitial pneumonia, as opposed to the usual interstitial pneumonia, which is more pulmonary fibrosis like you can have hypersensitivity change and obviously um, different diseases will have a little bit of different features so making the right label or diagnosis is important because it might depend on the prognosis but also just as importantly what treatment pathway should you be on so these are older uh, Canadian data. This is looking at Canadian data, the registry um, out of multiple sites in Canada, and looking at the pie of interstitial lung disease and who has these pulmonary fibrosis conditions. Now I'm kind of confusing you because I'm saying in one breath, ILD, interstitial lung disease, and the other pulmonary fibrosis. So for this registry, I'm just going to put them all together. The inflammation and or scarring of the lungs, not inflammation from asthma, not emphysema or obstructive lung disease, the interstitial lung disease changes. And you can see a large chunk of these people are connective tissue disease. About 40% of the Canadian patients with pulmonary fibrosis in this registry have interstitial lung disease, of whom about one in six of that group have scleroderma, about one in 10 of the group have rheumatoid and this unclassifiable or this, we sometimes call them um, uh, idiopathic pulmonary changes with um, autoimmune features. They have different names and different um, uh, journals that write them up. Um, that's about one in five of this 40% chunk. So it's taking up a lot of uh, the patients who are seen by the lung experts for these conditions are seeing my sorts of patients. So a rheumatology kind of patient or an autoimmune rheumatology patient.
So I am asked questions and I'm going to, I don't want to be a downer. I want to be realistic here. Um, but I think the biggest message is there's hope. And this field is changing. Every two years, we have new drugs coming to market. There is a lot of hope. But people ask me, how do I know if I have interstitial lung disease? How is it diagnosed? Does it always need treatment? And will it kill me? So they're the kinds of questions I get. So the first question, how do I know if I have interstitial lung disease? The presentation is sometimes found by accident. Um, we're listening to a patient's lungs, which might be the family doc, the specialist, whomever, and we hear the crackles. Often in rheumatology, it's at the bases, both sides at the bottoms of the back of the lungs, but it can extend upward. Or they're getting a chest x-ray because they have a cough or because they're post-COVID or they're getting a chest x-ray because uh, they're going off for surgery. So they're getting screened to make sure you know, there's no heart failure and things. And they go, oh, you have this this change on your lung, this inflammation or scarring or both, um, but also it's sometimes the workup of shortness of breath. So the most common cause of shortness of breath in younger people would be um, asthma, deconditioning, and smokers, it might be emphysema, although interstitial lung disease is increased in those who smoke as well. But or it's heart attack patients or heart failure patients, so angina patients, so shortness of breath or a clot on the lungs. So shortness of breath has a long, long, long laundry list of what it could be. But when someone's short of breath and they're worked up, that's sometimes how we um, find and diagnose interstitial lung disease. So it could be a primary care, like a family doc or nurse practitioner, a general internist, a rheumatologist, a pulmonologist, like that's a respirologist etc. So there's a lot of players that might be involved in figuring out what's going on. So that's how, so those are the three main ways that I would um, um, diagnose interstitial lung disease. Someone comes in short of breath and they have rheumatoid, or I listen to their lungs at every visit on almost every patient with connective tissue disease and, rheum and rheumatoid arthritis. I listen to the lungs at every visit. Not everyone does that, but why not? It takes four seconds and it might uh, change a, a, a label or help people early. So how is it diagnosed? So usually a referral is made to a specialist. So by, by somebody's ordering, if not the specialist, the breathing test. So that's called pulmonary function tests or PFTs. That's blowing into um, a tube and looking to see if there's a shrinkage of the lung volumes and poor gas exchange, that's what we're looking for. Whereas if you had um, asthma or obstructive lung disease, emphysema, it's a stretching of the lung volume. Not that it's better, but it's a wider. These are a shrinking volume. We do a high resolution CT scan of the lungs. So HRCT, we call it high res CT scan, high resolution to look at the architecture uh, around the gas exchange is kind of like the holes in the sponge that are good giving gas exchange all around that on the sponge is the architecture that the interstitium that can be inflamed or scarred maybe or maybe not yeah, um, depending on your symptomatology and what's going on you might need someone to go down with the tube into the lungs or to do a lung biopsy uh, usually on a base of a lung uh, we don't usually need that in our conditions unless if we think there's a superimposed chronic infection um, and you'll hear in guidelines that usually it's not needed for my types of patients so patients with connective tissue disease or rheumatoid arthritis usually first present with their connective tissue disease features that aren't their lungs or their rheumatoid arthritis um, swelling of the joints of their hands as a for instance but Sometimes the lung issue, the breathing problems are the initial presentation, but I would say in my practice, it's nine to one, nine out of 10 times, we already know their diagnosis before they have clinically relevant symptomatic interstitial lung disease. But about one out of 10 times, that's how they present. They actually have inflammation on the lungs. Someone's doing a bunch of tests and go, oh, they have rheumatoid arthritis antibodies. Hey, do you guys think they have rheumatoid? Things like that. So does it always need treatment? No. So not all interstitial lung disease will progress. That is different from IPF. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is progressive and needs treatment. 
Absolutely. And there's proven treatments for it, some of which we have borrowed now with proof in our diseases, um, rheumatology diseases, but not all in rheumatology will progress. So it could be stable and asymptomatic lung disease for years. It could be scarring from a previous pneumonia. And so we're saying, oh, we thought you had um, both sides, interstitial lung disease, bottom of your lungs, and actually it's something else and we, we've mislabeled you. Or it could be changes from smoke or medications. There's one of the um, antibiotics that's used sometimes long-term to prevent urine infections. Um, Nitrofurantoin are also called macrodantin that can scar the lungs. There's some chemotherapy uh, drugs that can scar the lungs. So there are patients where it's an incidental finding and it's stable for years, and we don't call that progressive. But the problem is in my patients, I don't know who's going to progress. In IPF, you assume everyone will progress, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So it's a little bit trickier, which is why we co-manage as a rheumatologist, I co-manage with a respirologist. So will it kill me? The answer is yes, no, maybe so. It depends. So this, if it's progressive, that's not a good sign. If people aren't responding to treatment, that's not a good sign. So if it's bad enough to need treatment, or unfortunately, sometimes um, their oxygen goes low and they can run into other problems that we'll talk about a bit about later. So it really depends on the severity and if it's progressive or if it's stable, and it might depend in some patients on the response to treatment. So yes, sometimes this will be the, the probable cause of death for people, but in room Rheumatology, not always. So our patients on average, on average, do better than the IPF patients, but not always, just on average. So this is just showing you that not everyone progresses. So don't worry about the words that we'll look at the graph. So this is looking at uh, patients with connective tissue diseases, and they had subclinical interstitial lung disease. So it was found that they weren't short of breath or anything like that. And so the subclinical ones are the orange, and you can see over eight years, um, about half of them will progress, not quite, about 60%. Uh, will not progress. And if it is no interstitial lung disease, obviously they're not progressing because they don't have it. That's the green. If it is clinical, okay, you have it, you're short of breath, we didn't pick it up by accident. You can see not everyone progresses. Now we're up to about 50% over the next eight years will progress which means 50% over the next eight years won't progress. So our conundrum is we don't want to over-treat and increase your chance of infection or expose you to side effects of drugs. We don't want to under-treat if you're in that group that might progress. So we have to know that. So over the next almost five years, a quarter of these patients will progress who didn't have symptoms, but we found it because we're listening to their lungs or they're getting a chest x-ray done. So um, that's why it's not always as easy as everyone needs treatment or no one needs treatment. It's, it's far more complicated than that. The other thing is, what about the pattern? So is it more important if I know your diagnosis of your connective tissue disease, or is it more important the pattern? And it, the pattern is more important. So the worst is UIP, the usual interstitial pneumonitis. That's what IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, has UIP. And our patients with UIP, um, this is uh, lung transplant free survival. So they don't, they haven't gone to lung transplant or, or they um, or they haven't died, they're alive. You can see the UIP people fall off that curve more quickly than say the NSIP, which is more common in most of my diseases other than rheumatoid, that's the blue line. And you can see organizing pneumonia, not very common. It used to be called COP, now it, or BOOP, it used to be called, now it's COP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. It's a feature on their scan. That's how we make that label. Um, they don't progress so much at all. They usually respond to prednisone and do well. So the label, the disease is important because it might de determine what kind of treatment if we need to treat and how much we'll follow or screen. But the type of pattern, bad imaging, which is IPF-like, UIP, 
is you're not going to do as well as some fluffy infiltrates without scarring or what we call honeycombing where think of honeycombing from the bees those holes are irreversible we can't at, at this point in time with our drugs we can't fill those holes in to make good gas exchange again so the clinical pearl here is that the pattern of the interstitial lung disease is more important for progression or detecting, determining if they're going to be around a long time or if it's going to kill them off over time than the actual connective tissue disease diagnosis. But some connective tissue diseases we screen for, like in scleroderma, we screen every patient for interstitial lung disease at regular intervals. In rheumatoid, I'm only going to um, screen by listening to their lungs or screen, investigate if they're short of breath. So um, UIP, the usual interstitial uh, pneumonia is less common in rheumatology. So it's not so usual for our patients. The nonspecific interstitial pneumonia or pneumonitis is more common, but in rheumatoid arthritis, they have more UIP, usual interstitial. But so just the patterns matter is what that means. So let's talk about some of these diseases. So first of all, looking at rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is about 1% uh, of the population worldwide, about 80% of uh, people with RA are women, 20% men. And if you, uh, rheumatoid arthritis can inflame the lungs and uh, lead to progressive lung disease anywhere between three and 8% of the patients, but it occurs in double that just to know. So it's more common than those who will fully progress. It's more common in men than we, like proportionately, it's always more common in women because 80% of our patients are women in this disease. But relative to the men of the 20% of men, there's a bit more interstitial lung disease than in the 80% of women. So being male is a risk. Age is a risk. Longer disease duration. Smoking is a risk. And probably possibly having positive antibodies of rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP called ACPA or both. Um, not every study shows the same risk factors, but they're the main ones. So there's a lot of publications now, should I screen all my patients? I am screening by asking about shortness of breath and listening at every visit. But most rheumatologists aren't thinking of doing that. It's because I have a big practice in, of connective tissue disease with interstitial lung disease. But um, we don't know we don't think we should screen everyone because that'd be a CAT scan and we pick up all sorts of little nodules that didn't mean anything and give a lot of angst and healthcare utilization and scare patients. But we don't know, but we should really at times ask proper questions. You can't just say you're short of breath. People go, no, I'm sitting here right now. I feel fine. So you have to ask like compared to a year ago when you're carrying in the groceries or you're going for a walk with your friend or your partner, um, are you slowed down? And if so, is it different? Why are you short of breath? You have to compare and ask a bunch of questions of normal activity, not sitting here right now today or short of breath. Most people would say no because we haven't asked it right. So this is a, a CT scan of this progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So all those little holes at the base of the lungs, there's some at the top part of the lungs too. All those little holes shouldn't be there. And you can see some inflammation or some change around it as well. Might be thickening, might be scarring, might be some um, pneumonitis or uh, inflammation around it. But having a honeycomb look isn't good. And if it's really bad, that's usually not a good thing. So about 7% of our rheumatoid arthritis patients will have clinically relevant lung fibrosis, a bit more common in men, one in 10 men, a bit less common in women. And this is saying something that although older age, which means you've had the disease longer, so longer disease duration, or you're older when you got it. So age is a risk and longer disease duration is a risk. But you can see that if you have rheumatoid arthritis with interstitial lung disease, you can see that you have a mortality rate where if you looked at 100% being alive, rheumatoid arthritis, mortality is going to go over time. This is many, many, many days. So it's thousands of days, which is many years, by the way. But you can see already from the very beginning that if you have rheumatoid arthritis, interstitial lung disease, you have a less good prognosis, higher mortality. And you can present with your ILD, you can get it early, but older age, longer disease duration are risk factors. But there's a sort of an cumulative incidence over time. Um, 
uh, who gets it, active rheumatoid arthritis, some of these people I already said, and if we're not using uh, good therapy for the rheumatoid arthritis, like methotrexate or anchor drug, you have a higher chance of getting interstitial lung disease. This is saying, though, that methotrexate is protective in our rheumatoid arthritis patients for getting interstitial lung disease. Can they get it on methotrexate? Of course they can. But if the, but giving methotrexate decreases the chance because it's our anchor drug. It's our appropriate care for most patients with rheumatoid arthritis, especially at the beginning. So this is saying it decreases the chance of getting rheumatoid, or, um, getting rheumatoid ILD. If you're on methotrexate for your rheumatoid arthritis, you get about a 50% reduction in getting it as opposed to if you're not on it. And that's found in all the studies. Um, it's a different question. If you have ILD, what do we do with the methotrexate? We'd say, well, you failed it because you were on it. It was protective and now you have it. So we need to treat more effectively. So methotrexate is not associated with more chronic interstitial lung disease. Methotrexate can rarely inflame the lungs looking like pneumonia, uh, high fever, um, high inflammation markers, um, looking like you're almost allergic to, it's like an allergic drug reaction, eosinophils in your bloodstream go high. Um, and that is not chronic progressive lung disease. It can scar your lungs or fully resolve, but that's different than causing chronic interstitial lung disease. So we always argue with the respirologists and general medicine. If our patients are admitted and they always say the methotrexate is scarring their lungs, we go, methotrexate doesn't scar lungs progressively. It's their rheumatoid is, so we got to treat the rheumatoid. So this is the opinion according to me. So green, dark green, good. Uh, other green, pretty good. Yellow, maybe. It's like a star, you know, green go, yellow, maybe. And um, the blue uh, are, is supportive care. So it's my opinions based on the literature, but it's not fully agreeing with the guidelines that we'll talk about after, but pretty much. So lung friendly are some of these drugs that you see, methotrexate, rituximab, abatacept, tocilizumab, maybe JAK inhibitors. Um, Prednisone might be lung friendly. I say might be in rheumatoid. It's more very lung helpful in lupus and Sjogren's and inflammatory myositis. Um, mycophenolate mofetil, also called um, myfortic or Celsept. Um, azathioprine and cyclophosphamide can help rheumatoid arthritis uh, lung disease potentially, but it's not very helpful for the joints, which is why I put it down a bit lower than the first green of lung friendly. Likely not lung friendly are some of our drugs like leflunamide and TNF inhibitors. And not everyone agrees that TNF inhibitors more recently in one study were in the yes, uh, can be lung friendly, but um, it's because way back when all when all we had was like gold and methotrexate kind of drugs then we'd move on to our worst patients got tnf inhibitors but our worst ra patients had a higher chance of interstitial lung disease so it might have been confounding by the worst patients got this these sorts of this class of drugs the worst patients had a higher chance of having interstitial lung disease the antifibrotics and nintendinib absolutely if not tolerated, possibly perfenidone. Why do I say that? Because perfenidone has a bit less data. And then supportive care. If your blood, is, if you have low oxygen, you need oxygen, you need to exercise, you need all your vaccines that we'll talk about. We need to treat if you have pulmonary hypertension and you might need lung transplantation. So some of the drugs are my opinion, but it's based on data. It's based on the literature. So for progressive pulmonary fibrosis in all sorts of diseases that weren't IPF, already proven in IPF, Nintendo has been around for many, many years um, in IPF. So now it's approved in Canada and else in most countries now, it's approved for progressive pulmonary fibrosis, including rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma and mixed connective tissue disease and things like sarcoid and allergic pneumonitis, et cetera, et cetera. So in all these conditions that were done in one big trial together, if you had progressive pulmonary fibrosis, these things really helped. So then looking here, um, the American College of Rheumatology does have treatment recommendations. So um, 
We'll talk about that shortly, but I want to talk about complications as well. So if you are lightheaded and not feeling well and you exercise and you think you're going to faint all the time, we have to remember you might have low oxygen because you have less gas exchange when you have inflammation on the lungs all over or scarring on the lungs enough, enough of it, you'll have low oxygen. So these, these people need to be treated with oxygen, sometimes only with exercise, sometimes 24 seven, and that would be um, evidence-based and that's usually the uh, respirologist will tell you about that pulmonary hypertension is high pressures going into the right side of the lung so you already have uh, lungs that can be quite stiff to pump into if it's very problematic and it's been a long time it's also difficult for the pulmonary arteries to pump into the heart and we have to investigate and treat that and two bad problems for your lungs is even worse than one so it can be a complication that having it is a really bad sign you can have wasting less strength. So exercise is really important. And by exercise, I mean two things, cardio and also chest wall exercises. And sometimes that's the respirologist sending you off to an exercise program. If you can't, my little clinical pearl is if there's no exercise program for interstitial lung disease where you live and you have interstitial lung disease, ask your doctor, hey, can you send me to the the cold, the COPD or the COLD, the emphysema program, if that doesn't exist, hey, can you send me to the heart attack program, post MI or heart failure program, which usually exists because heart attacks and heart failure are very common in most communities. So um, you, we usually sneak someone into someone else's uh, program because it's all the same to get people moving and to exercise even when you don't feel like it, even when you're, you're better to exercise, even if your oxygen goes low than not to exercise. And that we've learned over the last 20 years. And if you smoke, stop. And if you don't smoke, don't start, of course. Um, infections. So with infections, we want to prevent them. So all vaccines should be up to date. So pneumococcus, there's a brand new uh, Prevnar, plus there's Pneumavax, um, the shingles vaccine, um, the COVID vaccines, the flu shot. COVID vaccines are probably going to be annual now. The flu shot is annual and recommended for every Canadian, the flu shot. Um, RSV, so that's the uh, the lung virus. That's um, RSV was very bad last year, and it's predicted to be very bad of the next few years coming, like really adults going into the emergency room and being admitted with viral pneumonia from this virus, RSV. It's a thing that causes croups and little croup and little kids. So when that shot's out, which will be out soon, it's approved in US. I don't think we have it available yet in Canada, but coming soon, every uh, person with interstitial lung disease should be offered that. Probably every adult over a certain age as well, frankly, should be offered it. And then treating infection with antibiotics, if we think it's bacterial, antivirals, if we think it's viral. And some people even have antibiotics at home if they have recurrent infections so that they can get treatment right away. But that's not everybody and that shouldn't be everybody with interstitial lung disease it's a select group but if you have an infection so because sometimes we don't know and nor does the person living with it is this a worsening of the interstitial lung disease is it a worsening because of infection is there an infection that needs different treatment so whenever there's a big change in status we say somebody has to look at you or you have to get on treatment etc so I'm going to move on to scleroderma. So systemic sclerosis is the other way of calling scleroderma. Scleroderma means tight skin. It's an autoimmune connective tissue disease that can scar up almost every organ. It doesn't scar your brain, but it can scar your lungs, your kidneys, your pulmonary arteries, your, your skin, deeper to your skin, your uh, joints, et cetera, et cetera. So these are many of my patients with scleroderma. And you can see there's not one thing in common. They can look very different because it's got multiple manifestations and different subtypes. And when we look at the lungs, the two main lung problems that my patients get with scleroderma are the interstitial lung disease. That's all that fluffy infiltrate, all this stuff on panel A on both sides shouldn't be present. You see it's more at the bottom of the lungs than the top or a great big pulmonary artery that's blunted and that's pulmonary hypertension. But 
we diagnose pulmonary hypertension with an index of suspicion and going on to special tests. And we're not going to talk about those tests today. We're going to talk about the interstitial lung disease. So I have the 15% rule that we published looking at um, thousands of patients from multiple publications and databases. So for today's purposes, uh, about one in three of our patients with the diffuse, the more skin involvement subset, one in three have interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, but in half of them, it's clinically relevant. It's about one in four with the limited subset. Again, about half of them is clinically relevant. So one in six of my scleroderma patients will have interstitial lung disease. That's why we screen everybody because it's so common and because we believe early treatment makes a difference. So, the, you know, it's, it's something we have to look for in every scleroderma patient and any rheumatologist knows that. And most um, general internists know that as well, or they send them on to somebody to just help them screen. Why is it important? So this is the Ontario-wide data looking at um, scleroderma patients in Ontario um, uh, prevalent, so not just coming to, say, my clinic or Hamilton Clinic or something, like, or Toronto Clinic. These are people in Ontario that met the criteria of having interstitial lung disease or not and having scleroderma criteria. And what we found was even in the first year, there's a higher mortality if you have interstitial lung disease with your scleroderma than if you don't. So our mortality is never like that. You know, we will all eventually die, but you can see it's a bad slope, scleroderma, and even worse slope if you have scleroderma interstitial lung disease. And looking over the next five years, half the scleroderma patients with interstitial lung disease will have died. A third of scleroderma overall will have died. And if you look at 10 years, one third, again, ha will have died with scleroderma, um, but two thirds of the patients with scleroderma interstitial lung disease will pass away. That's why we need to screen. It's um, a complication that can progress in people and can kill them. And because we have treatments, so I can't cure it, but I can treat it. So um, death and early diffuse, where they have lots of skin involvement, is related to worsening of their lungs. So that's the forced vital capacity, the breathing test for um, having a restrictive lung disease and or worsening of their skin. So if you have interstitial lung disease early, it's a bad sign and we want to get on with treatment. So factors associated with poor prognosis and scleroderma, which would be true for anything I'm talking about today, any connective tissue disease and rheumatoid arthritis. If you have honeycombing, that's the UIP pattern um, on high-res CT, it's worse than not having it. If you have a lot of it, it's worse than having a little of it. So the presence of fibrosis is scarring. If you have low oxygen already, not a good sign or at any time, that's not good. If you have the superimposed pulmonary hypertension, that's usually because of low oxygen and the extent of the lung disease, those tight lungs that you can't get the pulmonary arteries to pump into the heart, the pressures go high, that's not a good sign. Interestingly, cough. So when I'm interviewing a patient and they're coughing constantly, I'm worried that their interstitial lung disease is worsening, or they have a superimposed infection, or they have post-nasal nasal drip, or they have concomitant asthma, or they have a drug that makes them cough like an ACE inhibitor. But I think about it is, are they worsening? And severe pulmonary function testing is also a bad sign. So this is true whether you have any interstitial lung disease other than IPF, because they all have a progressive pulmonary fibrosis with IPF. But it's true, and um, most of this is true in IPF as well. And so again, showing a CT with some of the honeycombing at the bottom part, not the top uh, on our side, on our left side. Um, so looking here next, so you should screen for interstitial lung disease and scleroderma because it's common. It has a high mortality. Um, and so it's at least one in six of my patients will progress and up to one in three will have it. And because we, it is somewhat treatable and we might be able, we're trying to reverse, stabilize, um, or slow worsening, depending on what we think we can do for treatment. So what's the progression of interstitial lung disease and scleroderma? Can I predict who will progress? No, but there are some risk factors. So this is looking at who will progress or not. So the worst are the 
red uh, dots, they're progressing the worst. And that's the small amount of people of um, about uh, 338, sorry, 200, 338 patients, only 16 were on that red dot curve. They're, they're bad news. They're progressing really quickly. So that's the outlier group. But overall progression is the dark red. And that was about 15% of the patients are progressing over the next five years in a, um, a rapid decline, and then it's not as fast. But there's also the blue ones that they're staying stable and then going down. And that's like another, uh, not quite one in three, probably 20%. So not everyone will progress. And look at the green. Some are going better over time. Maybe we're treating them, maybe we're, we're lucky. And some are going flat, right? They're not progressing. Flat's good. Up is good, down is bad, down fast is really bad. So I can't always, and this is just one group of scleroderma patients. So I can't tell who's on what line. I, I can if you're already really bad, that's easy. But at the beginning, when I'm trying to figure it out, I can't always tell. So men progress more in the US studies, African American uh, progresses more than say Caucasian ethnicity. The diffuse subgroup is more apt to progress. That's more skin involvement than the limited subgroup, certain antibodies, high inflammation um, as well. And also already having a bad CT scan or bad pulmonary uh, breathing test is not a good sign. Um, the other thing is our patients with scleroderma, every one of them has reflux. So we, you, you, everyone knows someone with acid reflux and scleroderma, even if you're not symptomatic, it's far more severe because the bottom of your swallowing tube a valve is inappropriately open. So acid comes from the stomach, comes upward, and they're refluxing because the, the swallowing tube doesn't contract in nice peristalsis. It's not strong and it's not coordinated. So it's like this, as opposed to strong coordinated. Those two problems, because of their scleroderma in their swallowing tube make you more apt to aspirate into your lungs. If you barf in your lungs, you will absolutely have a high, high, high risk of progressing your interstitial lung disease. And that's true in other interstitial lung disease, but our patients with scleroderma have the worst swallowing tubes of all my patients of, um, of connective tissue disease. So we got to be careful and treat that. So we now not only need the specialists in scleroderma, the specialists in the lungs, we need the GI specialists too. So it's a it's a real group uh, attempt to help people and having a nurse would be helpful too to help people. So justifying treatment if it's moderate to severe interstitial lung disease on imaging, on breathing tests, if people have worsened, if it's short disease duration and they already have it, if they have a certain antibody uh, type, if they are worsening on imaging, and if they're, I, they, it's funny because being short of breath wasn't in the list. So I decided to put it in. If you're short of breath at equal pulmonary function testing, um, then someone who's not short of breath looking, and I know you have interstitial lung disease from your connective tissue disease or your scleroderma or your rheumatoid. If you're short of breath and you have these issues, I'm more apt to treat you than if you're not short of breath, because I think the breathing, you know, people would like to feel better to breathe, you know, breathe more easily. We've asked experts, so mycophenolate mofetil is our first line treatment for interstitial lung disease and scleroderma. If not, we have cyclophosphamide, rituximab, tocilizumab. Some of what I'm telling you is off-label, meaning you might not get it um, through usual channels because it's off-label. Um, and if you have the progressive version, PPF or progressive pulmonary fibrosis, then antifibrotics and intendinib would be the first line, if not tolerated or not obtained, then maybe profenadone or maybe a clinical trial. And we don't love prednisone in this condition because number one, it doesn't work well. And number two, prednisone can give another problem in scleroderma of kidney crisis, which is a whole different problem. So looking here, this is a recent publication from 2000. Looking, this is from, uh, a nice review, but interstitial lung disease, you can see all those drugs, uh, drugs that I mentioned already, and also possibly an early, rapidly progressive bad skin disease. If you already have lung disease, sometimes people are getting um, an autologous stem cell transplant. But again, that's not for everybody. But lung transplantation can be a treatment. It's not contraindicated in our patients. So a couple of things are 
is there a window of opportunity? If I treat scleroderma earlier, will a patient do better than if I just wait and around? The answer is yes, no, maybe. And that's because not every study shows the same thing. So this study said the breathing tests were better if patients were treated earlier. This study says, um, uh, one study says, again, if we treat them early, that they do better on their breathing test, which is a good sign. They've improved more and they haven't worsened as much. And this study says, no, if you treat them early, it makes no difference. Wait till they're bad enough. It might be implying, or maybe the study wasn't big enough, or maybe the study wasn't long enough. So we don't know. So there's not, there's not a lot of agreement in whom to treat. So we usually do it sort of like a conference between um, not just the patient's input, which is really important, but between the specialists, the rheumatologist who might be a scleroderma expert and the respirologist or in the US, the pulmonologist, same thing. And this is saying early immune suppression did not prevent the onset of scleroderma interstitial lung disease. This isn't published yet. It was just presented in June, uh, 1,000 patients. So early treatment versus late. Do I treat early? Yes, if. I treat scleroderma interstitial lung disease early if the skin score is high or if I'm worried about them or if they have the wrong antibody that SCL70 or topoisomerase, which is an antibody we all can get, like it's covered on the uh, healthcare system to get it. Um, so what about prevention of interstitial lung disease? Not approved in Canada, yes, approved in the US, not approved in Europe for prevention of interstitial lung disease, this IL-6 inhibitor tocilizumab. So you progress more on the blue, that's the people having no decline or less, more of them are going this way to the bad side. The red is having more improvement, less decline is the uh, people that got the active treatment. And that's true, especially if you had interstitial lung disease coming into this trial. This was not an interstitial lung disease trial. It was an early scleroderma with high skin score trial of whom some of them had interstitial lung disease, but not all of them. So this also says if you treat really aggressively early, for bad prognosis patients. These are patients where I worry about, they're worried about themselves, but I'm worried about them as well. They're people I lose sleep on. So that's not everyone. That's 6% of my scleroderma population I'm talking about here. Rapidly progressive, high skin scores. If they got a whole bunch of drugs, they actually improved on their lung imaging or stabilized, which is way better and no deaths over the next three years. Is this standard of care? No, but it tells me if I'm really worried front end loading with a lot of drugs, they'll probably do better. This says that rituximab is better. Um, well, it's equally good uh, to cyclophosphamide and safer. So that's important. And that was looking at all sorts of connective tissue diseases. So rituximab has many proven trials. This is another trial that says it's better and safer. It's safer too. I didn't put that there, but it's actually better on the skin and the lungs um, than uh, looking at intravenous cyclophosphamide. And this is a systematic review of a bunch of studies, some randomized controlled trials, as well as other studies, again, saying rituximab has a role even if it's off-label in interstitial lung disease and scleroderma or other connective tissue diseases. Then this is looking just like I showed you on rheumatoid arthritis, and there were some scleroderma patients in the um, in-build study uh, with nintendinib versus placebo. These are progressing pulmonary fibrosis, bad enough interstitial lung disease, half were on um, mycophenolate mofetil, they were allowed to be half weren't. All of them were less worse off if they were on nintendinib than if they were on placebo. So in other words, nintendinib can slow the worsening, but it wasn't improving them on average. My immune suppressive drugs like rituximab on average can improve patients. So we use these, these drugs in unison in the right patient or just one drug or the other, depending on their profile, the patient profile. And this is, again, the in-build study also. I showed you this already, rheumatoid, but the scleroderma patients. You want to be on that side where it's, they're doing better on that graph. And they're all doing better than if they were on placebo. Perfenidone has some data uh, that it was, it was um, 
showing data kind of similar to Nintendo Nib, but um, the trials are small or some were stopped early. The trials are, are not as robust of data because the ends were small, the trial size were smaller, things like that. And there is consensus about what to do. So if you have honeycombing and it's worsening in scleroderma, you really should be on a Nintendo nib type drugs where we say, or they say in this uh, guidelines, and I agree. Um, and this is just saying how we would work people up and the types of drugs we think about, including rituximab and mycophenolate mofetil. There are main drugs that we would use to try to help improve the disease. Nintendo Nib to slow the worsening of the disease. And I showed the data already there. There's also a little study that said tacrolomus can be helpful too. So if someone doesn't tolerate mycophenolate mofetil or maybe doesn't have access, that's a different immune suppression. Um, tacrolomus is kind of like cyclosporin. It's used in um, not where you won't reject a transplant, but we use it in uh, connective tissue diseases as well. So this is a nice little study, not yet published, just presented. And we now have recommendations for treatment, including interstitial lung disease with some of those drugs that I have talked about. So there's good data here. So what are my goals for interstitial lung disease and scleroderma? I want to improve quality of life, prolonged survival. I want where possible reversibility or improvement, stability if I can't achieve that and slow worsening if they're already really scarring up. There's a treatment paradigm and always um, exercise, oxygen if you need it, screening for pulmonary hypertension and transplantation is an option. These are some of the other studies. So I can I predict the response? There is personalized medicine is coming, but we don't know enough about it yet. So the answer is I can't predict the response to treatment other than waiting three to six months or longer to see if there's improvement going on. Um, interstitial lung disease is costly. So the treatment is certainly justified. And these are the types of drugs that we were talking about. What about other connective tissue diseases? Um, sorry, I'll just go back. So dermatomyositis is the bottom uh, two bottom two pictures. Lupus is the top uh, face there with the sun uh, rash and malar rash. The dry tongue there is uh, Sjogren's. Um, the hands there are dermatomyositis and the hands up above are also mechanics hands from dermatomyositis. So Basically, rituximab or cyclophosphamide and prednisones, that's steroids, glucocorticoids, or cortisone in the, these groups, but not necessarily cortisone if you had scleroderma. And uh, rituximab we prefer, but it's harder to get it. So sometimes we have to, like because of access issues, it co it's costly. So sometimes we have to use cyclophosphamide oral or intravenous. Um, there's different antibodies associated with um, myositis and lung disease. So we know that you don't have to worry about that if you're the patient or the loved one of a patient, because we do these panels and um, there's different ways that the lung disease is going to progress depending on antibodies, interestingly. So um, looking at the prevalence here that if you have lung disease, you have a higher chance of not doing well and different ethnicities have different antibodies and that might affect how well you'll do. So we don't routinely screen for interstitial lung disease in lupus or Sjogren's, but if the patients have symptoms, they're short of breath or they have crackles when we listen to their lungs or their chest x-rays abnormal, then we investigate. In myositis, I will screen certain patients. Absolutely. I'll screen at least with um, a chest x-ray, often with breathing tests, and then go on to CT scan if we need. So we do, because we know the antibody profile and who's at risk. So um, treat the underlying disease. So we got to treat the disease activity of the connective tissue disease or rheumatoid. And we have to think about treating the lung as well. Sometimes it's the same drugs, sometimes it's different drugs. We don't use prednisone very much in some of the connective tissue diseases, so very little in scleroderma or rheumatoid more in the other ones. And the guidelines are out here. And um, I'm just going to go back here if anyone screenshots. The guidelines are out and you'll get access to this, but that's the uh, tag there where to find it's all free on the internet. They came out the American College of Rheumatology and they're mostly saying what I've told you. Um, we don't have 100% agreement. You can never have 100% agreement 
different between an individual and guidelines, but mostly what I'm telling you, and the this is a nice screenshot if you, you're interested in how we would treat people, but it's not fully inclusive of all the drugs and editorials are being written as we speak, speak saying, oh, wouldn't you do this or wouldn't you do that as well? So um, this is an excellent first attempt at trying to get rheumatologists up to speed in this area. And then when you fail first line treatment, these are the things that they're recommending. So many randomized controlled trials. So we are doing one, many people are doing randomized controlled trials in this space. So both um, the lung doctors and the rheumatologists. And I think there's great hope for people with interstitial lung disease. My patients are doing better in 2023 than 2018. And in 2018, they were doing better than 2010. We've come a long way. So I know I've talked quite a bit, but I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So Sharon, back Back to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Pope. That was really fascinating and such a, a good update from uh, about three years ago. So, you know, you've been talking about some of the drug treatments and some of the um, you know, comorbidities and everything. I've got a couple of people in the QA were asking, you know, quite often they'll get treated for one disease, but not both because the drugs collide or they, it makes them feel just awful. And so they feel like they're always suffering either with, you know, swollen joints and then, you know, while well, they take care of the, the ILD stuff and then that goes down and then it get, you know, taking care of the other disease. So can't they just have a balance? Like, you know, like, Right. So there's a, that's a really, really important question because we're trying to improve people's quality of life, not make them sick. And we also don't want to have too much immune suppression and increase the risk of infection, which can scar the lungs more. It can set off more scarring potentially or, or more inflammation on the lungs as a, you know, having inflammation there already can sometimes set off that scarring. So uh, basically, um, that's why I think we need more than one specialist and we have to put our brains together. And um, sometimes it, you can have two drugs and both of them are lower dose. Um, certainly, that, that's where I disagree with the American College of rheumatology guidelines. I, I mostly agree with them, by the way. I'm just now being a bit nitpicky. But something like rituximab has proven data to help joints and rheumatoid arthritis, loads and loads of case series of registry data where it can help the lung disease and rheumatoid arthritis, as well as lots of randomized control trials and the other connective tissue diseases. So why wouldn't we start with something like that than cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate, which is does sweet nothing to their joints in general. Because treating the inflammation, we know if you have higher swollen joint counts for longer, in other words, active rheumatoid arthritis, thinking traditionally about the joints, that you have a higher chance of interstitial lung disease or progressing it. So, um, but it's a really good question and we don't want people to feel sick. We wanna to try to improve their quality and their quantity of life. the uh, respiratory uh, respirologist, a rheumatoid rheumatologist, <laughs> Rheum yeah. a gastrointestinal specialist. Um, how would one go about advocating for all three specialists to work together? Because somebody said, gee, I never thought about, you know, them being connected. So how do I, who do I get to, you know, coordinate? Right, right. Right. So if we're talking about not like in this case, I'm answering not for IPF. I don't know. I know something about it, but I'm not I don't do deal with IPF. That is a lung isolated progressing pulmonary fibrosis. That's your lung doctor. And if you're aspirating, they know to send you to GI. Don't worry. But when I'm talking about rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma or lupus or Sjogren's or myositis or possible um, lung isolated autoimmune disease kind of thing. When we're talking about those patients, usually somebody knows to get the next person involved at the right time. That might be the respirologist, it might be the rheumatologist, it might be the general internist, but certainly a patient has a right to optimal care. 
a patient does have a right in every country, but we, we as people should have a right to optimal care. I didn't say the best care in the world. I didn't say, but you, you don't have a right to suboptimal care. You have more rights than that. So you need sometimes to advocate. And sometimes it's your loved one or your kid or your friend that has to help advocate because you feel sick. You don't feel well. And you're kind of, you can become far more passive when you don't feel well. So it's hard to be an advocate um, to your, for yourself when you're sick. So you need someone to say, hey, do they need a referral? This is what's happening to mom or my loved one or whatever. Um, they're choking at night all the time. Do they need something? Or um, their lips are going blue when you're telling them to exercise and they go out in the cold Canadian weather and their lips go blue. We go, oh my gosh, maybe you need oxygen for exercising. Let's test you. So there's things like that, that it twigs. And I, I we're not like rheumatologists. We're not expert in everything, obviously. And we're not, we, we are never taking the place of some of these other specialists that um, know an awful lot about areas that we don't. So I think always um, I, the nice way, what I always say, advocate. And if it doesn't work, then get your family doc and go around the specialist frankly, or your nurse practitioner or something. But the first way to advocate is saying, hey, this is going on. Do you think specialist XYZ might be helpful? I get those questions every day and I go, yep, that one might help you. Or no, like, you know, should I see an orthopedic surgeon about my knee? And I go, no, your knee damage isn't bad enough yet. Unfortunately, you're suffering, but the x-ray is not bad enough. So no, you don't need to go. But I'm not offended by that. That's a good question, right? Because I don't know to answer the questions that are on the patient's mind. I know my agenda, but I don't always know theirs. So asking, um, not demanding, but asking, hey, should my, you know, should I go see the lung doctor because I'm worsening? Or should I see the GI doctor because I heard that if I have inflammation or scarring on my lungs and I have this other disease, that if I'm if I'm having um, acid reflux and barfing into my lungs or refluxing, aspirating into my lungs, I going to do worse should I see someone I would often say doesn't hurt to have a look right I'd probably say that in lupus or Sjogren's whereas in scleroderma I know where to get you like when to get you to somebody right uh, because that's everybody with scleroderma swelling to frankly doesn't work till proven otherwise whereas it could work nicely and uh, uh it doesn't have to work well though but it could work nicely in Sjogren's or lupus or my myositis it might not work either so these are really good questions and because th there's no way one person can ever have all the answers um, nobody especially as a specialist we know lots about something I don't know about over here your family doc knows a lot about around here but they don't have to know lots about something here so um always think that if your healthcare providers, if you think of them at like a team, some of them are on opposing teams. They're not talking to each other. That's their problem. It shouldn't be the case. But you can say, can you please write a note to my other specialist? Here they are. Here's their address. Here's their first initial. So just type it all out and hand it to every doctor because the first answer is, yeah, I'll send it. But then when we do the note, we go, who was it again? And like, you know, I might have a person from Thunder Bay and I'm in London. I don't know the doctors there. So we want to make sure that the whole team knows what's going on. It's only good care. But not everyone thinks that way because they're just trying to letter to whoever referred you to them, right? As opposed to the whole team. So that's a good thing. I think there's a lot of things on the internet that help a patient to be organized for a visit. But if you have 10 pages of notes, you're not going to get them all answered at that visit just to tell you. So you might want to pick your top three and the rest, you know, maybe the if it's a teaching center, maybe the trainee can help answer, you know, four other or 10 other questions of concern. I try to answer them all while I'm talking to the patient while we're doing, you know, the prescriptions and everything. I try to write it out too, because like, yes, no, no, you don't need that. Here's why. Real quick answers, because then when they go home, because an appointment is scary and overwhelming. And you might even be mad and sad by the time you get seen because you're sitting around in my clinic for two hours before I see you. Sorry, but it's true. So so then it's hard to be um, as organized because you're kind of flustered maybe then. So um, try to take control of the interview by being organized, by having the doctor's list of the people that you see that really should get notes um, and have a list of your questions. And please bring in your meds because your med list is usually not exactly accurate. So bring all your meds into at every visit. It can never be a bad thing. If they don't look, that's okay. But if they want to know and they... It's hard for us to know all your meds because, again, that drug interaction stuff, right? We need to know that sometimes. 
So someone said, you know, they've had their doctor make these referrals, but it takes such a long time. Like, is there a way that you can nicely like call up the other doctor that you've been referred to? Or how would your doctor like get you ahead of the line? Because their doctor has said, well, you know, they probably get like, you know, a hundred referrals and, and you right. might number 99 and, you know, you're at the very right. bottom. Right. Right. So, how, right. How do you, right. Of, so, so it is tough. So first of all, if the status has changed, okay, we think you have interstitial lung disease because someone listened to your lungs in the family medicine clinic, say, so you're referred to the lung specialist, but now you're short of breath. Things have changed while you're on that list. Please ask your nurse practitioner, your family doc, whoever's advocating for you in the primary care setting, Please fax them back, email them, however you get a hold of them, and let them know things have worsened. Can you up their increase their appointment? Like speed it up. Or I mean, I, I we don't pick up the phone so much anymore because frankly, no one's answering. <laughs> Everything goes to the answer machine. But in in my group of doctors that I work with, um, even loosely work with, we email a lot of people and say, "Hey, I'm worried about so and so. Um, they're on your list. Can you please move them up?" That usually gets them moved up because I am worried. But if it's mild, I can't say move them up because they're anxious. I can say they're anxious and they're glad to take if you have a cancellation. But I can't say move them up because they're anxious because they got to also like that lung doctor might be seeing lung cancer that has to get in or the, a person discharged from hospital that has to be followed quickly to change up their meds so they don't bounce back into hospital, right? So we have to be respectful. On the other hand, um, I sometimes will say, if you, I'm worried about this person, if you can't see in a timely fashion, can you please tell me who will? Because again, I know who does ILD in Windsor and in Kitchener Waterloo, by the way, the excellent doctors in those areas that do it. I know who does it in London, Ontario, where I practice, but I don't know who does it in Orangeville if I have a patient bizarrely coming from Orangeville. And I know who I can refer to in Sarnia area because I know who the respirologist is there and who's very responsive in Woodstock, Tilsonburg and stuff. But I don't know every single area. And we have people like from Toronto, they'd be coming from, you know, 200 kilometers in any direction other than in the not into Lake Ontario but in three directions we have patients coming sometimes you know 300 to 500 kilometers because they're way up north and I don't know the rest well actually I do know the respirologists in Thunder Bay I do because like we share patients but I don't know respirologists in Sudbury as a for instance or in Sault Ste. Marie so if I'm doing a referral because I'm worried in anything ortho uh, respirology GI if you can't see, can you please suggest who will? Because a rejection doesn't help me. A rejection saying, well, Dr. X has a short waiting list helps me, right? We can't know everything. We don't have, we should have websites, by the way, of, and you look in your area, who's taking patients, right? Who has the shortest wait list? We should have it. But I get rejections every day from, say, ear, nose, and throat, but they don't tell me who the, who will see it. I know you'll see it, but you're too busy, but who will? So on every referral, I say, if you can't see, please tell me who will. I'm not making you send the referral along. I'm asking you to have the courtesy, your secretary, to say, Dr. XYZ's brand new. They just started with us. They'll see them. So we need, we need to do better because we're not servicing patients for optimal care if we have huge delays along the way, delay in access to the specialist, delay in access to the meds, delay in getting the breathing test, delay in getting the CT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not good care. We need optimal care for people with the least amount of delays. If someone is asking, you're talking about a lot of these drug treatments suppress your immune system. So, you know, with winter coming, with COVID, flu, RSV, like what should one do because other than short of locking yourself up in your own home and never going out like what what do you do like i know you said to take some of these um you know uh, right vaccinations yes. and update them and things but yes okay. which is really it is really important but you're right they're not 100% guarantee that you won't get influenza or covid and if covid goes into your lungs or influenza for that matter that's a scary business when you already have lung disease so what i can say interestingly is the patients with connective tissue disease seem to have cocooned more during covid and got 
interestingly, weirdly less COVID because they, if they were working, they started working from home before everybody else shifted. They wore masks the whole time and washed really well and frankly went out less. But for mental health, you have to get out and about. You have to. That doesn't mean you, you're you going to go in a plane without a mask and have people, the person sitting next to you coughing. It, you still have to do proper precautions. But for mental health, you have to get out and you have to see your the grandkids. And, and you know, all grandkids of, at a certain age have snotty noses like they just do. So be careful. Lots of hand washing. Don't touch your face. And I would say um, that caution wearing a mask. And we we now say, I just uh, frankly stopped wearing a mask the last week or so, but I'll go and say, I'll put a mask on if someone has interstitial lung disease out of courtesy to them, whether they're masking or not. I'll put it on before I go in the room. I'll put a mask on on any patient who's over the age of 75, because why would I want to make them sick? I don't know what I have. I don't have anything that I'm aware of, but I have grandkids. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to give the gift that gives something bad to someone else. So I think like physicians might not be masking anymore, depending on what situation, but wear a mask, wash your hands well, but please live life for your own mental health. And plus we I'm telling you to exercise and no one, everyone's bored, stiff exercising in their own apartment all the time. So you have to get out and about a bit, but I think being cautious that, you know, if you know, you have a grandkid that's sick right now, probably this isn't the day to go see them as a, for instance. So use common sense, but you got to live life and then you got to it's not Russian relay because you're doing the best you can to protect yourself. And that's why all the vaccinations, please get them all, get them all. Every person with interstitial lung disease should be offered all updates on vaccinations. And, and there's not a person, um, there's not a, a respirologist in Canada that would disagree with what I just said. Someone mentioned that earlier in your presentation, you talked about pulmonary rehab. And that if there wasn't one in their community that to get to try to get referred to the COPD rehab. But what was the third one that you were saying? Oh, okay. Or the heart failure or post heart attack. So there's there's cardiac rehab, that's the heart. There's chronic obstructive lung disease, the COPD or the COLD or the emphysema ones. They're in a lot of communities. Interstitial lung disease rehab is not in most communities, but the same rehab, uh, the same things apply to all three. So I have snuck people in. I totally have. I've snuck them into a smaller community for the heart failure one, like the heart attack patients and the heart failure one. So cardiac or heart rehab. I've said, my patient is not going to have a cardiac arrest. Like they're not going to stop their heart. It's safe for them to exercise. Please let them in. And you're running the program anyway. It's not over full. Please let them in. And they have. But I've had to ask a couple of times to kind of beg a bit. And for uh, when, for the, the communities that have the emphysema, the obstructive lung disease uh, rehab program, I just say, you know what? All the same principles apply again. Please let them in. And here's why. It will be life prolonging. It can improve the quality of life. Please let them in. And they usually do. Because they're not, you know, whether they have one more person in that group of 10 people or nine, what, what difference does it make? So you got to be, and that's where a patient can advocate saying, I've looked and in the community resources, I can't find that program, but I can find even the arthritis and aging um, activity program. It's getting your heart rate up, getting your muscles better, getting muscle tone. That's what we need. We need exercise for our uh, interstitial lung disease patients. Presentation, someone mentioned that you were talking about the prevalence in certain ethnic C um, groups. Um, could you kind of review that again? Because someone from the indigenous community was wondering, you know, um, are they more prone to that as well? Right, so that's an excellent question. So there are studies out of Canada, out of the US, because indigenous communities are many different ethnicities uh, combined, right? Because there's lots of different genetics um, of our, our ethnic communities. But um, for Indigenous peoples, they have for sure more rheumatoid arthritis in Canada than age and sex matched um, rest of the population, like general population. For sure, they have more scleroderma. For sure, they have more lupus. 
I can't say for sure if they have more myositis or Sjogren's, but they have more of those three conditions. And in those conditions of scleroderma and rheumatoid, they have more interstitial lung disease. So yes, higher risk. Um, in lupus, I can't tell you they have more interstitial lung disease because I don't think we know that. They have more um, Indigenous peoples with lupus actually might start earlier onset. They get more kidney damage, not more kidney inflammation, but more kidney uh, in lupus, but more kidney damage. And they also get more um, clots in lupus patients. So antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. That doesn't mean you'll if you're an Indigenous person suffering one of these diseases that you'll get these complications, but an awareness and on, on the part of the doctors, probably pretty important. And most rheumatologists are aware of what I just said. So much so, do you know um, anything about traditional Chinese medicine or traditional Indigenous um, uh, medicine that uh, could help this condition? Do you, do you have anything on that? Right, right. So just because I don't know doesn't mean it might not help you. It's just what I tell everybody. And, and it's funny because I was just talking, some of my kids are family docs, and we were just talking about this on the weekend, that if someone says, you know, I want to go to... Um, when I say this, pardon my ignorance, because I don't always know what I'm talking about, but I want to go to uh, the sweat lodge. What we would say is, please use your the prescription medicines, and then do whatever else you think might help you short of don't inhale stuff. We don't want, because smoke can inflame the lungs. So um, yeah, some ceremonies have a, you know, there's, there's nicotine used in some ceremonies, but I mean, if it's a wisp of a pipe once in your life, that is not going to ruin your lungs, by the way. But if it was something where it's inhaling a lot of stuff all the time, like sweet grass or something, I don't know what that does to your lungs. So I don't know that that part's ideal, but if people want to feel better, believe they'll feel better and go their traditional route in addition to, I'm a Western medicine doctor, right? So in addition to Western medicine, great. And ask first about, because mostly we don't even know what anyone's talking about because a lot of herbs and things haven't been studied well, but there's only a few bad things that I'd say, don't do that bad for your lungs. They're not bad for you overall, but bad for your lungs that I would say, please try not to do that. Um, we just had a young kid um, this week. Uh, when I say young kid, I see adults. So she's like an early, tw she's 25, but um, with, with new scleroderma, and she uses um, uh, she uses CBD THC to help calm her down. It helps her sleep better. It helps her pain. I said, you know what? I'm not against you doing that, but please stop smoking it because I don't want more problems in your lungs when you already have a condition and the antibody she has so higher risk of lung disease. So I wasn't against her using something that's uh, legal because it is legal in Canada, but I did not want her to be smoking it. So we had to have a dialogue about that. So as a, for instance, that if that helps her quality of life, great, but smoking it isn't great for now having a new disease. Well, actually, you answer the part of the next question because someone wanted to know what about the use of cannabis, you know, for pain because of the joints and um uh, you know, better sleeping and uh, and uh, opening up their appetite, right? So right. you're saying right. that it's okay to, to take cannabis as long as you don't smoke it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, correct. And to be quite honest, I, I've seen every, every response for some people, it really helps them. They sleep better. It helps their pain. Don't think it's going to help your inflammation. It might be a very, 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 very mild anti-inflammatory, but not enough to help treat your inflammation. But if it helps your appetite, helps to sleep or helps your pain, go for it. The biggest side effect then is usually cost or getting weirded out on it. It's usually CBD with little or no THC. Um, THC is the stuff that you like, you're not taking, people aren't taking it to be stoned. They're taking it to feel better, not as a recreational thing, number one. And number two, I have lots of patients where it doesn't work, but that doesn't mean they don't, they like, like anything, if it doesn't work, stop it. Unless if you're told, well, we think we're preventing worsening, you know, if I'm saying, 
you haven't had a fracture, but you're on an osteoporosis treatment, don't just stop it. Let's see if it's working by tests and you want, you're not going to feel better on an osteoporosis treatment. It's, we need tests to tell you if it's improving your bone density. But in general, if you're taking something for pain or sleep or appetite, if you try it and it works, great. If you try it and it stops working, you either up the dose or try something else. But the biggest side effect is cost for a lot of my patients. And it's not, doesn't nothing, none of what I've said in this whole talk works in everyone. And CBD does help some people sleep, does help some people's pain, does um, help them relax better because you can be quite anxious when it's hard to breathe, et cetera, but it doesn't work in everyone. Next question is that um, Fanny Palmer Feldrosa's Foundation, last year, we did a three-part session about diet and how it could help your inflammation of your joints and everything. Uh, have you ever recommended that to your patients to say, maybe work with a dietitian to look at the foods they're eating? Uh, because during our three sessions, you know, uh, uh, Tracy Reed had talked about how different cultures eat different foods, and some of them is, are just natural inflammation to your joints, and others are, are okay. So I don't know if you ever... Um... Right, right. So I can't, from the point of the view of changing your your lung inflammation or symptoms I, I i don't think there's any proven diet number one but number two if we're talking about rheumatoid or lupus um the things that that we have um data on the main one is the mediterranean diet and that is a little bit less inflammation than other than uh, than a regular North American diet will say, which is very very. This there's not one diet, as you said, and um, also in some but not all circumstances, uh, vegetarian or less red meat diet might also help inflammation a bit. But I'm saying this with a Yes, that is true. And you might feel better. And if you feel better, that's great. And also sometimes it's less lowering your calories because if you eat some of these diets, you're not pigging out on chips, say, um, which can increase, you, you can might lose weight and then you'll feel better too. So that's good. But to actually help the inflammation a lot or treat the inflammation a lot, um, these diets have this much effect like an Advil effect, not like a methotrexate effect or not like a biologic effect. So they're not, they're, it's good, healthy eating. And to be quite honest, I, I, you know, we have people from all sorts of cultures because Canada is, um, you know, the beauty of Canada is that we're multi-ethnic. And so I usually say, you know, if you look at what your grandparents ate, maybe that's what you should go back to, Right because that is probably a less calorie and a more rounded diet because what's happened is we're all into prepared foods and your grandparents didn't have that. They just didn't. So so if you eat like your grandparents, you might do better. I'm going to ask the audience, if you have any more questions, please submit them now. Uh, otherwise, we're going to close our session with uh, Dr. Pope. And um, I just want to say, Dr. Pope, that it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much for updating us on this situation. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to see the progress in um, medicine and all the studies, because all those drugs that you mentioned, we didn't have that three years ago, but we have uh, research and data now to back it up. And so now less people are suffering from it because they can have access to it. And, oh, someone else wanted to know, if they wanted to see you, Doctor Pope, how would they get there? Um, right. Like, where, like, what, what's your territory so that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. So I'm not trying to poach patients from others, just to know. But, um, you know, if someone has scleroderma or rheumatoid, and uh, they want another opinion, or they haven't seen. Um, a rheumatologist or something yet um we're i'm happy to see them in general but if they said oh uh ask the family doctor say i heard dr pope talk and i really want to see her you'll probably get in because i have a little bit of a soft spot because people who need education sometimes feel they might not get it from their current healthcare team because we're all we all have different skills right so 
Yeah, so that might get you in the system. If <laughs> you said, uh, heard I heard Dr. Pope give a lecture and I'd really like to see her and my diagnosis is X, Y, Z. Not you referring yourself because you won't get in that way, but your primary care. Or if you even asked if you had a rheumatologist and said, hey, can I go to a more, um, when I say expert site, I'm not an expert in everything. Obviously, I'm not an expert in ankylosing spondylitis. I'm as good as the other rheumatologists in that, and there's some way better. Um, but in, in this area, this is an area that I know in research, I know in clinical care. Um, yeah, I know in giving lectures. I know the data. One last question. So, so I want to know, I mean, you have all this data about how to treat, you know, these diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, but has research looked into what causes them in the first place? Because perhaps if we prevented that, then we wouldn't be in the situation that we are currently in. Which is excellent. And um, we I don't really know if interstitial lung disease is going to go down over time because smoking was a lot, then it went down, now it's going up again. And smoking is only one risk factor. M most people that I know with interstitial lung disease have never smoked. So it's only a risk factor. But silica inhalation, so having foundries without protective equipment and sometimes it's the kids of the foundry worker or the spouse of the foundry worker it doesn't have to be the foundry worker foundry has um, road workers glass uh, production workers all those things they're risks that doesn't mean you've had any exposure to get it the other weird things I guess it's weird um, is that again if you are um, I, I won't put it weird I'll put it here's the positive frame if you have a healthy diet and normal body weight and you exercise regularly and you sleep well and control your stress and you have one or zero drinks a day and um, you um, have enough adequate vitamin D, you can decrease your chance of lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, probably scleroderma because we haven't looked in scleroderma yet. Um, you can decrease the odds of getting it by a certain proportion. So um, healthy living is good for you, not just because it's good for your heart and good for your longevity. It's actually decreases autoimmune diseases. And the more trials are coming on, how do we prevent if someone is at risk of getting diseases like, like pre-scleroderma, how do we prevent if someone has pre-RA? And we're not there yet to tell you how to do it, but, but research is trying to figure that out because if we could stop a disease early before you have all these uh, damage problems or even symptoms before you have many symptoms, um, turning off that immune thing uh, would be great. And I think the days of AI and chat GPT and all that kind of stuff that's going to help us understand uh, genetics, understand risk factors, and maybe even suggest ways of trials that we should do to kind of turn off the high risk patients. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions. So I want to thank you, Dr. Pope, for coming on today and making this wonderful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Pope. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thanks those for listening too.